Hey everybody, how are y'all doing today? Alright, awesome. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Ron and this is Ryan. And we'd like to welcome you to our marketing club event about understanding the millennial generation. Uh, growing up in the 80s, I wanted to be as strong as AC Slater, today by the bell. I wanted to learn karate from Mr. Miyagi. Uh, and as a millennial, I sometimes spot myself in the shower singing, I got one little fight, my mom got scared. Just so we can be on the same page, let's label the four generations that happen to be on college campuses today and in the workplace. We have the old time veterans, we have the baby boomers, we have the generation Xers, and we have the millennial. We're going to focus on the characteristics of each one. We're going to focus primarily on the differences between the boomers and the millennials, just because the differences there are greater than foundation for what I'm about to present really came out of the work of these two gentlemen, Hal and Strauss, in some of their seminal work and has been built upon countless times. It happens to be one of my research areas, so a few hundred doctoral dissertations, a few thousand articles published in this area. So the stuff I'm sharing with you today, today is based in good data. Just a quick overview. Generational differences. The four generations. We're going to try to understand those with a cloud of a bunch of concepts and stuff I'm going to throw at you. And I'm going to ask you if you could connect the dots and make some sort of sense of this, this mess we call generational differences. And I'm going to try to throw enough things at you that you'll see that it's important to understand. Because I've presented and researched on five continents, generational differences, whether it's the Federal Reserve Bank, or it's the military at West Point, whether it's human resources at a university. There's a problem with millennials and boomers trying to get along. Let's look at why we have a problem and see if we can solve them. Generational differences. Bottom line today, I'm going to try to argue that if we understand a little bit about the differences, and if we actually consciously attempt to express a little empathy, that we can make both the classroom and the workplace a better place. The goal here, I might add a hierarchy here, we're not just looking at data points or information, but what we really know, and I'm trying to push us today into that little understanding levels so we have to understand one another. So me as a boomer, if I can understand my millennials a little better, maybe we can communicate and vice versa. So that's a goal for today. But I have to set the stage. Okay. So one of my favorite stars, Wayne Gretzky, was known as the great one. Many people see him as the greatest hockey player of all time. And when asked what made you so great? He always answers the same way. Is that while other skaters skated after the puck, I always skated to where it was going. That's pretty 
basic, but yet pretty profound. We're at a turning point in this university. We can either hang on to the past or we can embrace where this university is going. The workplace is changing. We can either hang on to the way it used to be or embrace the workplace of tomorrow. That's the challenge. Old guys like me don't like letting go. Does anyone know what that is? Slide. Slide. Yeah. So in 1973, every engineer in the world had to take a class in how to use a slide board. The world's <laughs> changed. In 1973, HP came out with this little device. There's an actual HP 45 calculator. 35 to 45. There were professors at universities disallowing the use of a calculator, saying it would destroy education. It really ushered in the computer era, and my message on this slide is let's embrace it, right? Let's embrace it. At some point, things are going to change. Why? Well, because students are different. They've changed. Workers have changed. The classroom has changed and our workplace has changed. Millennials are here and they're not going away. They are. They've delivered us their first wave and their tsunami and we're being felt right now in the classroom workplace with the second wave of the millennial tsunami. So I have to throw a ground rule out there before we get started because it's difficult to understand some of what I'm going to tell you because you have examples that will go against what I'm saying. So everything in life is a bell curve and we know that. It's a normal distribution. And there's an average for that and that's all I'm working is that when we take the average of all millennials, they have some average or mean and some variance of that curve. It's that simple. And that the boomer's average is a lot different. So you may know a millennial yourself that doesn't behave that way. That doesn't mean the average is not what it is. So let's not talk about outliers, right? Let's talk about averages. I want to get that out of the way. Another thing I want to get out of the way is Knowing and not knowing. So, the old adage of, you know, he who knows and knows that he knows is wise, follow that person. He who knows not, and he knows he doesn't know, right? That's our job. Because you can teach that person. The frightening part is he who knows not and knows not that he knows not. Someone that doesn't know what he doesn't know. We're supposed to run from that, right? And the reason is that many times people who don't know what they don't know actually think they know. So the real question here is, what do you think you know about generational differences? What do you think you understand about the professor who's a different generation from you standing before you? Or the professor looking down at the millennial students? What do you know? What do you think you know? And the psychology folks call this unconscious incompetence. Hang on to our slide rule, or we can embrace change. I'll give you one example, one quick example. A dear friend of mine, borderline destroying a marriage. Um, he was asked by the uh, marriage counselor, Ben, do you understand when I say consideration, being considerate? You know what that means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a well known attorney. I study the English language. I know what you mean. So she said, Ben, when I gave you those tests last week, we tested consideration. Where would you score yourself? And then, modestly, <laughs> then I'd probably give myself a 92. She said, Ben, you scored in the lowest one percentile of everyone that's ever been tested. He didn't know what he didn't know. That one piece of information changed his family life, saved his marriage. One piece of information. If we can 
understand each other a little bit more. We don't have to be clueless. We can move forward. And I would ask you to take it a step further because whether you're on Main Street or Wall Street today, the big word is empathy. I'm trying to understand your employees, trying to understand your customers, trying to understand across borders, right? So empathy is putting yourself in someone else's shoes, seeing things through their eyes. Not just because you know, but trying to see things through their eyes. And empathy really is the highest level of understanding or listening. So I would ask you today as I present this, that let's try to practice a little empathy. Here we go. Wow. We have the veterans who came out of the war duty bound, respecting authority, civic minded, wanted everything in a military hierarchy, and then the boomers came along. And boomers were born into a world where there wasn't enough stuff. They had to fight for everything they wanted, from a place in the sandbox to a place at the university. They grew up as fighters, so they were driven, driven to succeed, and they created adjusted for inflation, far more wealth than any other generation. Driven. The Xers came along, the boomers weren't the best parents to the Xers, the late veterans weren't the best parents, and they grew up as latchkey kids, skeptical of the world, and made a lot of promises, and didn't deliver. And then we have the millennials, and we'll talk more about them later. I'm a boomer. I get that you're full of energy, and I get that you're bright. I get that you're intelligent. I understand you're techno-literate. I get all that. I get that you're the greatest generation of multitaskers ever. I get it. Why does it feel like this? <laughs> That's what concerns me. I'm white, you're black. You're black, I'm white. I'm black, you're white. We're just different. We're not understanding one another. And as a result, we're butting heads, pulling our hair out. <sighs> Let's try to understand one another at the deepest level. One more thing, and then we we'll move right into it. If I'm Muslim, or Jewish, or Buddhist, it doesn't mean I'm better or worse. I'm just different. Right? It's just different. So in my classes, I use this example quite often. A person analysis, which is an analysis of personality, much like Myers-Briggs. And it has four simple colors. Right? And it's so easy to understand that the red people, red personalities, they're action-oriented and they're opposites. The blue people are thinkers, not action. The green people are systems-oriented, detail, and they're opposites. Yellow or socially connected, spontaneous folks. And if you're dominant in one of those colors, the other three colors just seem weird to you. The point I'm trying to make here is we're just different. That's the takeaway. We're just different. And being unique is okay. And no one color is better than another. No generation is better than another. But we're so different. Okay. Lots of stuff I just tried to cover sort of to pre-frame us to set, it up, set us up for discussion about To make things simple, we're going to divide these generations into 20-year periods. So veterans were born from 1920 to 1940. They're in range from 73 to 93. So they're just now leaving the workplace. There's a few of them around, not many. We have a few professors that fit into that range, but not a lot. And they will soon be leaving. Boomers the next 20 years. So you can see, based on the years, where you fit, where your parents fit, where your grandparents fit. So we talked a little bit about the veteran, very proud, the boomer being very driven, the Xer. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to follow your rules. And the millennial, bright, brilliant, hopeful, and we'll see 
how that impacts us in the classroom and in the workplace. So let's focus on those two groups. I made this slide. I'm just going to throw these points up there and move on. Studying generations goes back to the time of Aristotle. Okay. Um, bottom line, the best thing you want to read is right here. As a cohort, during our formal years, we experience life and life-changing events as a peer group, as a peer cohort. And as a result, we form a peer personality. That's where the force of generational differences come from. So for those baby boomers out there, maybe some of these words make sense to you. Right? They were the first generation that was thrust out as adolescents to fight their way through the 60s and 70s. Difficult times. Survive on your own. They turned out to be very deliberate parents with outcomes in mind for their children. So as a result, they controlled their children in a big way. We call that helicopter parenting, where you hover over your children. They were very educated, and they were big cheerleaders. As a result of being big cheerleaders, they told their children all the time that they were fantastic. And it was that generation that started spending more time with their children. Fathers spent more time with their children. Families got smaller for each child, had more personal attention. So we had some changes underway. Millennials, on the other hand, from a boomer perspective, for the boomers in the room, when we say these things, they make sense. To a millennial, they make no sense. Times have changed. The Microsoft icon for save the file, it's a floppy disk. Many millennials haven't seen a floppy disk. And that floppy disk isn't really floppy, right? This is a floppy disk because it's floppy. We live in a different time. Just let that soak in for a minute, how different our generations are. I'm a boomer, and I know it sounds really sex, drugs, rock and roll. That resonates to my core. I don't understand the goody two-shoes stuff over here. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It wasn't the way the life I lived. But as you look across the differences, the outlooks a different generation has on life, the way they approach work and authority, how they look for leadership. For example, a veteran if you want a good relationship with me, demonstrate some sacrifice. I'm throwing a lot of these things up there just to get them out of the way, just to show you that there are tested, proven, major differences between the generations. slide, these are the turnoffs. So for the millennial generation, they hate sarcasm. My generation doesn't have a problem. If I use it in the classroom, I don't get the same response I did 15 years ago. Facebook with millennials. They like the quick feedback and constant feedback. Boomers, give me a performance review once a year, I'm fine. We have some empirical evidence that shows that if you really want to bump over, uh, millennials along, praise them six or eight times a day.
I'm not going to bore you with this slide. There's a lot of research. The yellow little happy faces, those are millennials. When we go out and group and test things, the dark cloud is the uh, boomer generation. And you can see there's a gap between those two. I just wanted to demonstrate that there's a gap. So let's meet the millennial. are so perfect, and again, bear with me, I'm poking fun at you for a reason here, that we changed our national pastime. We changed the game of baseball. We eliminated that silly little part of it that was the out. At the end of every game, regardless of the score, if we kept score, everyone got a trophy. We had parents hovering over us. This is known as the safety generation. We protected our kids, put them on leashes, baby on board, right? I grew up in a generation where I rode my bike every day. I didn't know what a helmet was, right? And yet today, you go to jail if you let your kid ride without a helmet. 